Welcome, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We have a wonderful evening this evening. As all of you know, we have five extraordinary uh, candidates and public servants here. Uh, Joe Avalone, uh, Don Berwick, Martha Coakley, uh, Steve Grossman, Juliet Kayyem, and Mr. Key here, who is gets the mister since he's the moderator. <laughs> um, uh, and so we'll have a terrific evening this evening. I would just want to say a couple of things besides the fact that we are deeply honored to have all of you here. And all of you have been here in one form or another uh, uh, over the years, and so it's terrific. This is a place that's about public service, and so it really is such an honor to have such extraordinary public servants here. A uh, couple of things uh, just by reminder. First, uh, obviously, the school itself is, is uh, uh, nonpartisan. We happily welcome a similar event with the Republican candidates. Um, a uh, second point I just want to make, which is obvious, but sometimes gets lost during the political season, which is uh, we care very much about dialogue. Mm -hmm. There will be a chance for questions uh, after their opening statements, but what we expect from you uh, in exchange is that they get the chance to speak during their time, and uh, questions will come at the end. And if not, we'll have to escort you out. Um, without further ado, let me just briefly introduce Trey Grayson, who is our director here at the Institute of Politics and who is the uh, former Secretary of State of Kentucky, um, a, a very well-known uh, person who f cares about civil society, uh, effective elections and the like, was head of the Republican Secretaries of State, uh, former Secretary of, of Kentucky, as I mentioned. So without further, Trey Grayson. Thanks, David. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Again, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. The Institute of Politics was founded in 1966 as a living memorial to President Kennedy with a dual mission to bridge the academic and political worlds and to ins uh, inspire students, particularly undergraduates, to consider careers in politics and public service. And so we can't think of a better way of that kind of inspiration and that kind of bridge building than bringing the five candidates up here on the stage today. Um, tonight is a really special event that we're hosting in conjunction with the Harvard College Democrats and uh, all the candidates here for governor on the Democratic side in Massachusetts. Harvard College Dems President Daniel Key, who also serves as the Communications Director uh, of the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee, is going to moderate tonight. And so for all the folks in the media, make sure you preserve the pictures and images of Daniel, because he'll be something someday, <laughs> and you'll be able to say you were here for him. Uh, he's, unfortunately, he's from California, so it may be that he'll be running in a different state. Uh, but he studies government with a focus on American politics and began his involvement with Democratic Party politics as a volunteer on President Obama's successful 2012 re-election campaign, coordinating efforts across colleges uh, all across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And since then, he's interned at the Democratic Governors Association and served as campaign director of the Harvard College Democrats. And as I said, he's originally from Cupertino, California. And unfortunately, he's a Giants fan. San Francisco Giants baseball, not New York Giants football. That's an important distinction here in Boston. Um, but we're really glad to have Daniel, and he's going to moderate tonight's event. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Key. Yeah. Thank you very much, Trey, for that uh, kind introduction. As Trey said, my name is Daniel Key, and I'm the president of the Harvard College Democrats. Uh, tonight, we're incredibly excited to be hosting the five Democratic candidates for governor here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, before we get into the format of tonight's event, um, I wanted to thank some of the people who made this forum possible. First, a thank you to Trey, uh, the IOP staff, the forum staff, uh, for letting us host this event in the wonderful venue that is the John F. Kennedy Jun Jr. Forum. Um, second, I want to thank all the candidates for coming. Uh, and finally, I want to thank you, the audience, for coming tonight, uh, making time at your busy schedules uh, to come to this forum. So the format of tonight's event is relatively simple. Um, I'll be introducing the candidates, um, and each of the candidates will have three minutes to discuss his or her platform and their campaigns. After that, we're going to open it up to audience questions. So I'll ask you to address questions to the candidates as a whole, uh, since each candidate is going to have a chance to respond to every single audience question. Uh, they're each going to have two minutes to respond to those questions. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the first candidate on our panel. Uh, that's Ms. Juliet Kayyem. Uh, she's been a lecturer at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Ms. Cam is actually a graduate both of Harvard College and the Harvard Law School. After serving as a sur civil rights attorney, uh, she worked in the Governor Patrick and President Obama's administration as a political appointee and a homeland security expert. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Juliet Cayenne. That's it? That's it. Uh, 
No, Lester, uh, thank you so much. You know, I, I'm normally last, so I need to have to catch my breath now. <laughs> and thank you all for being here uh, today and tonight, because uh, this is what it's all about, especially for a candidate like me uh, who uh, entered the political fray for the first time in this race. So I want to just tell you a little bit about me and, uh, and my vision for Massachusetts. My name is Juliet Kayyem. There are many ways to describe me, as I would suspect there are many ways to describe uh, most of you. I am a mother of three children, uh, a wife, a public servant. I've served two governors and this president. Uh, I've been a writer and a Boston Globe columnist, a teacher here of emergency management and national security leaders, the daughter of a Lebanese immigrant family. All those different ways of describing me lead me to two conclusions about this race and about Massachusetts. I believe uh, in government's capacity to do good. And as Democrats, we have to say that every day. I also believe it can always do better, right? There is no finish line. There is no, thank you very much, Deval Patrick. Let's go to the other team. There's no next in line. This is not a popularity contest. This is a fight uh, for our state and the party, right? And the challenges that we have, whether it's income inequality or an infrastructure that's barely keeping us together, uh, or education that's satisfying some of our children and not the others, are challenges that are only going to be solved by harnessing the collective will of all of us throughout this state, right? Our mayors and our citizens, the private sector and the NGOs, those who are committed to making the state the most welcoming, the most protected, uh, and the most prepared, uh, and the most connected state uh, for our children and our grandchildren. And to do that, takes sort of you know, shaking things up and getting people outside their lanes and not looking at the things that divide us, whether it's secretariats or city lines or, or borders between uh, different towns, but to actually right, harness right, our common capabilities. And that's what I've done all my career. I started as a civil rights attorney for a uh, Governor Patrick. He was actually Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Breaking open doors, leveling the playing field for women and African Americans and immigrants and those who came here uh, uh, to make uh, government work for them. Because when government levels the playing field, amazing things happen. I later turned to public safety and security, serving as the governor's homeland security advisor and then President Obama's assistant secretary. That is about investments in making us more prepared and more secure from whatever challenges we have. It's about risk reduction. Right, investments in infrastructure and transportation and communication. It is also about crisis management. It is not something that I shy from. I have been in the bunker, as many of you uh, remember, in Framingham, and I have been in the Situation Room. It is when we look to mayors and governors and a president to make government work when it matters the most. As a Democrat, I believe it matters all the time, and I am grateful for your time today uh, and grateful for your commitment to the democratic process because this is what it's all about. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, that was impressive. Military time, military time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Steve Grossman, who is the Treasurer and Receiver General, a fantastic title, uh, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, he received his undergraduate degree in Romance Languages from Princeton University, and shortly afterwards, his MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, since then, he has served as the Chairman of the Massachusetts Democratic Party, the Chairman of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and the Chairman of the Democratic National Committee. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Grossman. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the great Nobel laureate Seamus Haney once wrote the following. He says, history teaches us not to hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up, and hope and history rhyme. I'm running for governor to make hope and history rhyme once again in Massachusetts. I'm running because I believe that the people of Massachusetts want proven leadership that will leave no one behind. Look at Massachusetts as we sit here tonight. Gateway communities all over Massachusetts, struggling mightily, high levels of unemployment, high levels of economic impairment, low levels of academic achievement. And we have a responsibility in this wonderful state of ours to make sure that we leave no one behind, that we leave no one out. And that's going to require significant investment of our time and energy and our resources over these next four years. 
That's what a governor does. A governor leads, a governor guides, a governor defines a vision for the future, and then a governor implements that vision. I've spent my life creating jobs. First, in our fourth generation family business, it was created 104 years ago by my grandfather. My grandfather was an immigrant. He came here, 1900, second youngest of 13 children, but he had a vision for his life. The vision for his life he defined for me once when I was a senior in high school when he said, Steve, there were four things I wanted to do with my life. He said, I wanted to have a healthy family. I wanted to educate my children. I wanted to own my own business, and I wanted to give something back to the community. That's what brings us all together here tonight. How do we give something back to the community? One of the things I'm proudest of in this campaign is that we put together a Young Professionals Advisory Council. Why? Because I didn't think it was appropriate for me to tell young professionals who are the backbone of our economy, the backbone of our workforce, what they should think and what their values and problems and challenges were. I thought it was important to ask them, to ask you, what are the things that we need to do? What are the biggest challenges we face? Not surprisingly, they talked about jobs. They talked about student debt. They talked about housing. They talked about transportation. But they talked about a bright future. They talked about a sense of energy and excitement and optimism. I also asked them to define a set of solutions. So I'm going to ask all the young professionals here tonight to join me in this campaign, to go on our website, stevegrossman.com, to take a look at what the young professionals in this campaign have done, to be part of that Young Professionals Advisory Council, to be part of a statewide conversation about what the future can bring. This is a state in which we leave no one behind. We level the playing field. We give economic opportunity, educational opportunity to every one of our fellow citizens. And in doing so, the bright future is ours. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is Martha Coakley, who is the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a graduate of William College and the Boston University School of Law. Ms. Coakley served as the District Attorney of Middlesex County before becoming the first female Attorney General in the history of the Commonwealth. She was also the Democratic nominee to replace Ted Kennedy in the Senate in 2010. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Martha Coakley. So we're at a pretty critical time in Massachusetts, and it's a time when we need to move the state forward to be both prosperous and fair. I think it's crucial that we do both those things, that we turn this economy around for everybody, not just people at the top, not just Wall Street. I think everybody needs to share in that. Uh, we need to do the best job we can educating our kids, and many of you have had that opportunity who are here tonight. We also need to make sure that we give everybody health care, both for physical health and for mental and behavioral health. You know, I've spent the last 16 years as a district attorney and as an attorney general, both on the campaign trail, but in dining rooms, in diners, uh, in courtrooms, in classrooms, talking to families, talking to businessmen, talking to folks about what are their hopes, what are their fears, what are they concerned about. And I've had the opportunity, both running for office and serving in office, to sit with a family, wondering what's going to happen when their six-year-old daughter has to testify at trial sitting with a family, wondering whether after 18 months trying to deal with Wells Fargo, who's about to foreclose on them, whether they can keep their home or not. Sitting with a family who became a family because we were able to successfully challenge the Defense of Marriage Act uh, and make sure that marriage equality was going to be the law of the land here in Massachusetts. And most recently, sitting with a family after the marathon bombings, wondering and struggling with the future now that dad had lost a leg. Those are experiences that I've had, and I know that it's important for the next governor to bring those experiences to the office. I think that as, you know, my own dad worked his way through college. Uh, his father had died early. Uh, he went to Brown and was able to work his way through Brown with part-time jobs, which my guess is nobody here could do that today. He believed, and my mother believed, that if they gave all of their five children a good education, which they were able to do, and that we were able to chart our own way in life and work hard, that we could do better even than they did. But I don't think that families feel that way anymore, and I don't think people sense, kids and families, that they have that opportunity. If people can't be focused on climbing up that ladder of opportunity because they're too worried about falling through the floor. 
which is why we need to raise the minimum wage, which is why we need to provide earned sick time for people who should get it, who should get that opportunity for that economic success, to give every child a safe and good education, starting with pre-K, and if they want to go to college, make sure that we, they have that opportunity to do it. Finally, although we lead the country in healthcare access and quality, it's still expensive here. We need to work on that. But we also need to make sure that we reduce the stigma around getting help for behavioral and mental health care. That's true whether you're in third grade or in college, you're a returning vet. It's really important that we could do that here in Massachusetts. So I ask for your consideration as I run for governor of Massachusetts. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Don Berwick, who is a former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He's actually earned three degrees from Harvard University, the first from Harvard College, then from Harvard Medical School, and finally here in the Kennedy School. A longtime healthcare advocate, Mr. Berwick served as president and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So let's all welcome Mr. Don Berwick. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for being here. It's especially meaningful for me to be here. I was in the second ever uh, health policy program at the Kennedy School, and it shaped the way I think, and I'm very indebted to the school for what it gave me and shaping me in my, my future. Uh, my name is Don Berwick, and I'm, I'm a pediatrician. I'm also an executive. I started a nonprofit organization 25 years ago that grew to one of the largest in the world today, working on health care improvement and community improvement all over the world. Uh, then I was asked to come to Washington by President Obama uh, to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that's the largest agency by budget in federal government, $820 billion a year. Uh, and it's the lead agency for health care reform. Uh, I, uh, I went there. The Republicans had other ideas. Uh, Glenn Beck called me the second most dangerous man in America. Uh, that was my welcome to Washington letter. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, Republicans uh, blocked my confirmation, but I was able to serve as a recess appointee for 17 months. It was an amazing experience. I got to work on health care as a human right and begin to make this nation finally join the rest of the civilized world in making health care a human right. Uh, and now I'm back in Massachusetts, and I'd like to be the governor. And that's because with Washington in gridlock and the public losing faith in the ability of government to solve large problems, this nation needs a beacon. It needs uh, a political entity, this state, to show the way and to show how a progressive agenda successfully implemented can help people. Uh, we're a, a state that can do that. We're the first state to make health care a human right. We're the first state with marriage equality. We have the best energy policy in the nation. Uh, what we need to do is reassert the progressive agenda, and I am a progressive. That means I believe that we need government to help us create the communities and the commonwealth that, that we really want. I grew up in a very small town, and in that town, when you were driving down a road, and there's a car stopped at the side of the road, you stopped your car. You always stopped your car, and you said, can I help? We need to reassert that value. Glenn Beck may call me dangerous, but I'll tell you what's dangerous. What's dangerous is leaving a child hungry, leaving a worker unable to make ends meet for their family, even if they work 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week. It's dangerous to take away unemployment benefits from people that are looking for work. It's dangerous to leave elders having to choose between medicine and food. It's dangerous to forget that we are, in the end, responsible for each other. It's dangerous to leave our prisons full of people who need help, not imprisonment. Um, I want to reassert the progressive agenda in this commonwealth. We need to show the nation what's possible. We need to recover a vocabulary that's getting lost in this nation about compassion and equality and social justice is fundamental to the communities we want to build. That's going to take courage. It'll be a fight, but I want to be governor to have that fight. Thank you very much. Last, but certainly not least, is Joe Avalone, who served as a senior vice president at Parexcel International. Uh, Mr. Avalone received his undergraduate degree at Dartmouth College before receiving two degrees at Harvard, uh, an MD from the medical school, and a master's in public administration here at the Kennedy School. Uh, he has served at the United States Navy Reserve Medical Corps and on the Wellesley Board of, Wellesley, excuse me, Board of Selectmen for a six-year term. Please join me in welcoming our final candidate, Mr. Joe Avalone. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Dan. And thanks, all of you, for being here tonight. I have to say, it's one of those uh, wonderful moments to come back to uh, a school that I graduated from. I can't tell you how long ago. Uh, <laughs> it was a long time ago. Uh, to be running for high office. So it's really one of those uh, wonderful moments. And I hope that that will happen uh, to some or many of you uh, in the future. Um, I'm running for governor of Massachusetts because I love Massachusetts. And I want to give back. I went into medicine 40 years ago because I wanted to help people. I went to Harvard Medical School and became a surgeon at Peter Mint Brigham Hospital, now Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, I learned an awful lot about the struggles of people in their lives in those days, um, but later became a leader and a manager in the health system itself. I was the chief operating officer of Blue Cross and Blue Shield in the 1990s when we modernized Blue Cross. We controlled our health care costs, put in place some very important preventive medicine programs. Then I was an entrepreneur down the street in Kendall Square, and for seven years during the early days of the internet, I ran a company that tried to use the internet to lessen the time frame to develop new drugs so they could get to doctors and patients earlier. And then for the last seven years, I've been running a very large global division of an international medical research company. It's called ParXL, based in Waltham. We have 50, 15,000 excuse me, employees in 50 countries, about 3,000 here in Massachusetts. So I run a large global operation. I know what it's going to take to bring new industries here to our, to our shores and into our state uh, in order to build the new kinds of middle class jobs that we need to do. I've been running for a year, been in 130 cities and towns and over 400 events. I've learned an awful lot about the Commonwealth. And my, uh, my uh, governorship will concentrate on these four areas. First, jobs. We need jobs throughout the state. They have to be based on new industries. We need to have the work skills from our community, state colleges, and vocational schools to make sure that we can bring those jobs here. That's been my experience running a global enterprise. We have to close the achievement gap in our high schools, in our schools. Too many children and too many communities have their lives defined by where they're born and where they're growing up, and that's not right in our state. We can do much better, and we must. We have to do something much more radical and different with our drug problem. You probably have seen the, uh, the tragic uh, news of all the overdoses that we've seen in our state. This is the iceberg of a problem I've been seeing all year. We have a huge and growing addiction problem. We have to stop treating it as a criminal justice issue, move it to health care. I proposed an office of recovery that will do that so that these people will get treatment rather than jail. And we have to do something very bold about the environment. It's a ticking time bomb. Uh, I have proposed, as the first candidate, to propose a carbon tax that will put the true price on carbon, including the externalities, a concept I learned here at the Kennedy School, <laughs> uh, offset as a revenue neutral by lowering taxes other places. These are the kinds of things we need to focus on in the Commonwealth. I think my background is right for the times, and my experience will allow me to be the leader we need now, and I very much would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. So that concludes the opening statements part of tonight's forum. Uh, now we move on to you, the audience. Um, before we get into the audience participation part, I want to remind everyone about the rules for questions at the forum. Um, first, uh, I'd ask that you introduce yourself, uh, give your name and your affiliation to the school. Um, second, make sure you're giving, asking a question instead of giving a speech. Uh, and third, make sure your question ends with a question mark, not any other punctuation mark. Um, the last thing that I'll add here is that uh, I'm asking that all the candidates, or excuse me, the questioners ask questions for the candidates as a panel instead of specifically to one candidate. Um, but without further ado, we'll start over here. Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm a junior at the college. And my question is, all of you have mentioned education, and I would like you to elaborate, oh, this isn't going to end with a question mark. Okay, <laughs> what specific <laughs> policies do you have in mind in terms of closing the achievement gap and raising educational achievement in Massachusetts? We'll start with Mr. Applin. Uh, back to the normal world order. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I was a little yeah. bit off there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I have a very uh, detailed proposal. It's actually on my website. Uh, my two goals for education are close the achievement gap. That's my highest priority. And also to make every child college and career ready. But with regards to the achievement gap, I'm going to create a special fund as my highest priority in the through the legislature to fund what we know works in the at-risk schools, the schools that are not performing well. And that includes pre-K for those schools and also lengthening the school day. We know pre-K works. Uh, we will measure the progress. And we know that we can get a much higher literacy rate by the third grade, which has a huge impact on uh, those children's ability to graduate, finish school, and even go on to a good job or, or otherwise on to higher education. We know that lengthening the school day can work. 
as long as we have the right kind of a, uh, academic support and enrichment programs. And I also have an innovation grant proposal as part of this for these schools to deal with the issues that are in the community that often have a strong bearing on this, like multiple languages, uh, nutrition issues, and the like. <coughs> this package is my highest priority, uh, and it will be funded as my first priority uh, in, the, in my administration. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks. I think it's, it's hard to name one keystone issue in any commonwealth, but if you have to name one, it's education here. Uh, I want to pursue it at three levels. Uh, Pre-school pre preparation. I'm a pediatrician. I understand the needs of kids before they're five, before they're third graders even, and they need help to be able to be successful in school. Uh, we'll have universal pre-K if I'm governor, and we will um, invest in uh, readiness in third grade for reading. As Joe said, it's, it's key. Uh, for elementary and secondary schools, we have an equity problem. Uh, there are failing schools and failing children, and we need to commit as a state to excellence right across the board. I am very concerned about the tendency toward teaching to the test and, and standardized testing and uh, ad adherence as the main thrust of policy and education in elementary and secondary schools. I think we're demoralizing teachers. I had a 10-year-old ask me at a coffee the other night. She wasn't drinking coffee, but she asked me. Uh, I said, uh, she said, what are you going to do about education? And she said, well, I'm only taking tests. I'm not learning. And I think she's right. Teachers are not the problem. They're the solution. And my investment in elementary and secondary school will be developing the, the, the the joy, the pride, the learning, the growth of the teaching workforce. And when you do that, schools get better. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum are our publicly supported higher education in this state. It's really crucial. Ninety percent of the kids in higher education, publicly supported higher education, stay in the state. And there are more, more young people in public education than there is in private universities in this state. It's an on-ramp to social mobility. Those uh, public uh, colleges and uh, and state universities uh, are not invested in sufficiently now. Their facilities are aging. The, s the staff are not getting the support they need. And I would have firm investment in a world-class public higher education system in this state right across the board. It's smart, it's smart investment, and it's smart growth for people. Thanks. Well, I agree with everything that, that, that um, Joe and, and uh, Don have said. So let me address a couple of other things that I think are really important to make sure that every kid gets the opportunity to do the best that he or she can do. Because a lot of our kids, particularly in our gateway cities, do come to school, uh, even with pre-K, even with an extended school day, but they come hungry or they come with abuse or they come with a learning disorder. They come with other problems that the teachers aren't able to deal with. So one of the things I think is important, and I've seen this because working in the criminal justice system, I've seen kids who have not succeeded in school, even as early as third grade or certainly by eighth grade, and I've seen what happens when they don't succeed. And if we don't recognize and identify those other problems the teachers can't deal with, uh, and we could do that, I think, by aligning the social services we now provide in the state but are somewhat siloed. If we had social workers in the school who can work with kids who have those problems and make sure they get the help they need. So that's one piece dealing with the other piece of kids' life, and the other piece that I think we're behind on is both the technology and the curriculum. Um, fewer than 600 kids last year passed an advanced placement in computer science in Massachusetts. And it's not because they don't want to take it. It's that we're not prepared to do it. Uh, one young woman up in uh, the northern part of Middlesex County said her high school said, hey, you're on your own. Go on the internet. And we were able to match her up with a teacher in Malden, but she wanted to take computer science, and the school wasn't prepared to do it. Our kids aren't going to get those jobs tomorrow, gateway cities or not, if we don't have them learning the skills they need. And the last thing I think that we need to do, teachers are the key to this, but we haven't invested in the kind of technology that will help our kids and our teachers do the best in the classroom. We live in a state that should be on the cutting edge of that. We could do that, and we'll work with our private partners to make sure our teachers, our schools, and our kids have what they need to do well in education. So the two minutes that I have, I'd like to make four quick points. First, uh, I have made it clear in this campaign that I'd like to make every public school in Massachusetts digital learning ready by 2016. <clears throat> I chair the Mass School Building Authority. I travel all over the state. We've got almost 1,800 public schools unless we can give our teachers and our students the kind of technology they need with high quality teaching, highly motivated teaching. We won't achieve the goals we have set for ourselves. Second. We've talked about universal pre-K. We have 25,000 three- and four-year-olds on a waiting list for pre-K. Oklahoma figured this out 15 years ago, and they offered universal pre-K. 
Georgia did the same thing. We think of ourselves as number one in public education, and we have 25,000 kids on a waiting list. That's unacceptable. But these things have consequences. If we are going to clear that waiting list, it's going to cost us about a quarter of a billion dollars a year. There's only four ways that you can fund that kind of an investment. You can grow the economy, public-private partnerships, or you can take a look at revenue. And I think the next governor and us as candidates, we as candidates, are going to have to leave this commonwealth. And I am prepared to leave this commonwealth through a discussion, if need be, of how do you find the revenue to finance and to fund universal pre-K so that no young person is left behind at age three and four. That's a critical conversation. It's got to be done. And the people of this commonwealth will invest in universal pre-K if they believe that it will pay off in the long run. And finally, I have talked about creating a 21st century teacher corps. I'm going to go into the colleges in this commonwealth, every college, and offer sophomores in college an opportunity to give five years of their lives to the teaching profession, not just by giving them the salary that they would make as a starting teacher, but by giving them an additional stipend of $12,000 a year or $60,000 over a five-year period. Bring the best and brightest of this generation of college students to the teaching profession. Let's bring the best into our classrooms so that we can create 21st century education for this year's, for this generation's students. I can answer your question both as a mother and as someone who wants to be governor because we're somewhat similar in this regard. My, when my kids are school age children uh, and my commitments to education are based on my own experiences. Uh, so first, universal pre-K, we all agree with it. Uh, and you only have to enter a kindergarten classroom uh, in a public school where my kids who have the benefit of uh, actually daycare here uh, 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 enter with hours of you know, sort of reading and, and educational experiences and the gap that existed in kindergarten in their public school. And that gap hasn't closed. That gap, you know, without the intensity of a great teacher and a great community, that gap doesn't close. Uh, so universal pre-K is important uh, for all of our children, but as a governor, uh, it's important because it puts the state at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, we are far behind other states, and that gap, that achievement gap, is only going to grow until those kids who cannot get back on track, right, enter a criminal justice system that is putting them in jail for way too long uh, for opportunities that they could have gotten if only, if only we had committed when they were two, three, or four. How do we pay for it? We take a criminal justice uh, system uh, that is eating our budget alive, right? Uh, uh, Mass Inc. now uh, concludes that by 2020, prison construction alone will, be, uh, will cost this state a billion dollars, right? So don't tell me I can't find a couple hundred thousand dollars to educate children uh, in this commonwealth when I'm going to spend a billion dollars on, the other, uh, on prison construction. So we can just shift the orientation on the other side. Because if we, let me just say, if we can solve this problem, a lot of what you're talking about won't go away, but it is easier for teachers. On the other side, right? What we need to commit to is uh, standards that work for our kids and our teacher, right? So I can't, I'm not gonna sit here and say, I'm, I don't like standardized tests. Look, we need some sort of assessments that work for teachers and the students. And without that, then we won't be protecting our children or our teachers. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question will be from over here. Hi, uh, I'm Louisa Kerman. I'm a sophomore at the college and also the events director for the Harvard Democrats. So I want to say thank you again for coming tonight. Um, many of you have mentioned mental health as an area of concern for our commonwealth. And so my question is, what specific policies will you push for that will ensure that every citizen gets the help that they need? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Berwick this time. Uh, we have to reemphasize the importance of mental health and mental health care in our health care system. Our health care system is not functioning properly. We've got to change our health care system, in my opinion, in two fundamental ways. First is to reorganize it around the real needs of real people, and mental illness plays an enormous role there. When I was running Medicare and Medicaid, for example, we had information uh, readily available that a diabetic person for uh, a year in Medicare would cost about $10,000 for care of their diabetes. If they had depression, it was $24,000. So to separate mental health services and physical health services makes no sense at all. We have to reunite them. That's going to have us move toward a much more integrated health care system, and I've worked on that for 30 years. I know what those systems look like. We need to birth them and support them here. We also need to change the payment system. I'm the only candidate favoring single-payer health care in this commonwealth. It's time to simplify the payment system, get organized around the real needs of real people. 
the, a big area of problem in mental health care is substance abuse. It's, it's, it's running rampant. I was told by the, by the guy that heads one of our uh, uh, county houses of corrections just two days ago that 50% of the prisoners in that county house of corrections have mental illness and most of them substance abuse. I'm declaring a goal for this commonwealth of 50% reduction in substance abuse and suicide in the, in the next 10 years. It can be done. I've worked on that worldwide and I know what that looks like. This is a reorientation of the healthcare system around the real needs of people instead of around keeping hospital beds full and machines on. We need to orient our health care system toward health. And with that, we'll save money and we'll produce better outcomes for people. Ms. Helke? So I think it's really important, as I mentioned in my opening, that we work on reducing the stigma about getting help for mental and behavioral health issues. I mentioned my family, four girls, and my younger brother, Edward, who was very smart, good pianist, graduated from Williams, uh, but at age 17 started to show signs of uh, bipolar and depression. Uh, he wouldn't get help for that because he said, well, I'll, I won't be able to get a job, I'll have something on my record. So because he wouldn't get help or take medication as a result of which he couldn't hold a job and his health deteriorated. And after my parents died 18 years ago, uh, he committed suicide. So my family lived with this and they would have done anything to help him. And it's only recently that my sister and I have started to talk about it. And I won't ask for a show of hands here, but I know if I asked, you would all have a family member, a friend, a colleague, someone who has suffered from depression uh, or bipolar or some other mental health behavioral disorder. Um, it is one of the reasons we see in high schools and earlier, children who don't do well in school, who drop out, who commit suicide. Uh, and so, first of all, we need to address that. We've made it a shame, a weakness to be mentally ill. We have to encourage our veterans to get help with PTSD. We've seen the result of failure to do that. And I think as we move away to a system that is fee for service towards more primary care, more identification, echoing some of what Don said, I think we are able to then both diagnose and treat earlier a mental health behavioral disorder, just as we would early intervention <coughs> with diabetes, make that available for people before they deteriorate, before they get to the stage where they need the emergency room. And then when they get to the emergency room, uh, you know, there's no payment there. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I think Massachusetts is the state that can do it, should do it. We have the biopharmaceutical industry here. We have the best doctors here. It's time to end that stigma. So this is a hugely important investment that we need to make, and we have not been making the investment. If you look at Massachusetts in comparison to other states in New England over the past five years, you'll find that we have cut our funding for mental health services, behavioral health services, substance abuse programs more than any other New England state. Campaigns are about our values. Campaigns for governor are particularly about who is going to lead the state and lead a discussion about our values and our priorities. We've talked about mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse. We've talked about public higher education, universal pre-K, and a variety of other investments. These are expensive investments. And I think it's very important for all of us to recognize that if we are going to have the Commonwealth that we want this Commonwealth to be, that leaves no one out, that leaves no one behind, we're going to have to invest. We're going to have to ask our fellow citizens, potentially, if we can't find savings, if we can't find public-private partnerships, and if we can't find money from growing the economy, that we're going to have to potentially take a look at additional revenue as a way to make these investments. So I would suggest to you that one of the most important conversations we can have, and with the young professionals and young people who are college students, immediate college graduates, young professionals who are going into the workforce is, what kind of a state do we want this to be? Where are we prepared to make those investments? And how are we going to pay for those investments? I believe the people of Massachusetts, if they saw meaningful, serious investments in mental health, behavioral health, and substance abuse programs, would make those investments if they felt that we were going to create a healthier society in which no one was left out and no one was left behind. Uh, from my own professional experience, I just want to highlight uh, two sort of pools of people that I think we need to spend particular focus on. The first is the military and our returning veterans. I have worked with the military all of my career. I oversaw the National Guard when I was the governor's Homeland Security Advisor. Uh, it is a strange thing to oversee the deployment uh, schedule uh, for a war that you don't even believe in, which was the case uh, with me. Uh, but our veterans are returning, and they've returned. Uh, we have 400, close to 400,000 in this state. 
but the ones who are returning from the wars of the last 11 years are suffering from mental illness uh, for the consequences of the multiple deployments. One of the highest growing populations in our prison is our veterans. We are solving their problem, uh, their problems, uh, our problems, to be honest, by uh, incarcerating them. And what we can do uh, is not only support mental health services for them through Veterans Affairs and, and the Veterans Department, uh, but also shift the orientation if they do do something, right, or if, if they get caught up in the criminal justice system to, to what I've been advocating, which is veterans courts. Uh, there are, there's one in the state. Uh, the Pentagon will pay for them and support them so that we get our veterans, this huge pool of, of people who need our help, uh, uh, out of the criminal justice system. The other pool of people I think we need to focus on for mental health issues is our uh, teenagers and, uh, and, and, the, and the kids that we're raising. Uh, I, when I was in uh, the Civil Rights Division, I brought, one of, I brought the first federal complaint against the school district for what we called peer-on-peer -peer harassment. We now call it bullying. I, I was well aware of it then that this is something that is uh, harming our children because the victims uh, be, you know, carry stigmas, commit suicide. Uh, so we need to, to uh, promote kindness uh, amongst our children in ways that we can support teachers and our community uh, and stop uh, the, uh, you know, sort of the system, this victimization that a lot of kids feel that then leads them to uh, have mel mental illness. Well, um, much of what is said I certainly agree with. Martha is right. This problem of mental health and substance abuse uh, either uh, it touches so many families in our Commonwealth and uh, probably many of us personally uh, know people, either siblings or brothers. So this is an issue for all of us to come to grips with. And clearly, as a commonwealth, we have not. Steve is right that uh, over the past five, six years, we have cut the funding for mental health about $90 million. And we had an inadequate mental health system before the recession started. So we have to build back what we've taken away and continue on. And what we're missing is community centers uh, and for community treatment, where people could stay in their communities and have the appropriate counseling and drug treatment if need be, if need be that they require. And then also the substance abuse facilities that I talked about before. Uh, there are multiple dimensions to this, but as Don said, uh, we need to move our whole health care delivery system, and the next governor will be front and center doing this towards what are called organized systems of care. That was doctors working in teams. That creates a huge opportunity to change how we deal with mental health, to make it integrated so that we have teams of doctors that include mental health uh, uh, providers as well, uh, and we're dealing with the patient holistically, changing the payment system so that, uh, that we don't stay fragmented and siloed will be a big part of that. So there's an opportunity as we move to these organized systems to integrate mental health much more than we have in the past. And we also have the law now which requires parity so that the amount of money that gets spent for mental health treatment should equal the amount of money that gets spent for physical health treatment. So we have a great opportunity as we change our health system to bring mental health and substance abuse much more into it in an integrated way so that we can treat patients, many of our family members, in the way that, uh, that we should. And it's a great opportunity that we should not miss. Um, I want to go back to my office of recovery. Dealing with addiction per se means getting people out of jail and into the treatment. This will be a huge issue for the next governor. Uh, it's going to take someone with a health care background to be the bully pulpit uh, champion for this, and I would do so. Thank you. We'll go back over here. Hi, my name is Megan McHugh. I'm a sophomore here at the college, and as a lifelong Massachusetts resident and product of the public school system, it is amazing to have the opportunity to get to interact with you guys. Um, so my question sort of stems off the education uh, question, and I know some of you mentioned this, but there are a lot of factors um, outside of the classroom that affect a child's ability to get a quality education. My question is, what are your specific plans uh, in terms of making sure that we identify kids who don't have access to basic needs, what be it food or shelter, and making sure that uh, DCF, whether it's improving DCF or other programs that you plan to implement to make sure that these children are, uh, have access to those basic needs that really affect their ability to even uh, enter the classroom and get the quality education that you guys spoke of. Ms. Hilton? Sure, well, it sort of goes to what I said earlier in terms of understanding that we need to make some changes to modernize our school system, because the goal should be to make sure every child can do the best that he or she can. And that does mean paying attention to exactly what you've identified, making sure that some of those needs, whether they are learning disabilities or abuse at home or coming to school hungry. I mean, we, we know ki there are kids who you know, are upset 
when school gets out in the summertime because it means they're not going to get school lunch. I mean, most of us don't think about that, but it, it's a real problem for kids for whom the school is the place they feel safe or is the place they get food. Uh, and we can do better, particularly given what we do spend in other agencies now, but too late and not effectively around identifying and addressing those issues. So if you are able to put in schools, and not just our gateway city schools or schools where there's achievement gap, all of our schools should have the kind of social network contact so that when a teacher, or there's a bullying issue, or a teacher identifies a problem with the kids, kid who's coming late to school, kid who is missing school, there's usually something else going on. And being able to identify that, sup give support to the family through other agencies that do that, through uh, DCF or uh, DMH or other agencies that are set up to do that, but through the school, instead of waiting till there's a real problem and then having that problem siloed, not doing it as well, and doing it more expensively, the schools are the one thing that holds people together and frankly can provide not just for the kids but for the families who need help better identification and services. I think we could do that much more effectively, frankly, without looking uh, to spend more money because uh, that is a good investment and just realigning what we do now and getting a better result, I think uh, we could do that very easily. I think there's a direct link between a lack of educational attainment, particularly in our many of our industrial, older industrial communities, our gateway cities, and poverty. I think we need to deal with this issue of poverty, and this issue of poverty, particularly in our 26 gateway communities in the neighborhoods of Boston, so often is about jobs and the lack of opportunity that exists. Um, as we sit here this evening, we have 250,000 people out of work. There are another 250,000 people who are underemployed. They're working less than 20 hours a week. They want full-time jobs. They can't find them. We get 800,000 of our fellow citizens who are on food stamps. We sit here and are having this conversation this evening. Almost a million of our fellow citizens woke up this morning. And they didn't have a single hour a year of earned sick time. Poverty has a huge impact on the ability of those kids to go into an educational environment and to be able to learn, to be able to have the resources they need, to be able to have the resources at age three and four. And really, it starts before three and four. We should start at birth and think about what do we do between birth and the time those kids go to kindergarten? Because those are the critical years. If we don't deal with those issues around poverty, we won't have those kids able to catch up. Those kids won't be reading by the time they're finished with the third grade. They'll fall behind. They may never catch up. And if they don't catch up, the pathology of poverty will catch up with them and will create the kind of things that go on in their lives that Juliet talked about so eloquently earlier around their involvement with the criminal justice system. I also believe the arts are critical, and I think it's absolutely critical that we offer the arts the cultural resources, the creative side of the child's life. And if we don't bring the arts more into our educational environment, we're missing a huge opportunity. Uh, the challenge of a campaign is to not only uh, sort of answer the question for today, today, right, in the inbox, but to make sure they're sustainable for the future. So I want to look at sort of long-term solutions to your good question. I have become convinced, I have worked in state and federal executive service, uh, that uh, the big challenge is big data, that government does not do it well, and we see it every day. And as Democrats, we should be actually particularly angry about this because we like the services that are delivered. Uh, whether it's a website uh, for health care, whether it's uh, sharing information. So, so one of the challenges that you point to on DCF was really that there was so much information about, or there is so much information about a particular family, uh, that none of that is getting around in a way that's meaningful for a caseworker who's doing essentially God's work, because it's really hard to do the jobs that they do. Uh, uh, to know what actually, how to assess all that information. So a commitment to big data, figuring it out, making it work for our communities and our individuals so that the delivery of government services is effective, is efficient, and so that people believe that government can work, right? Because that's the challenge. The other long-term solution is, of course, uh, economic development. Uh, as Democrats, we, uh, we talk about income inequality a lot today, and that's important. But we have to understand what it actually means. 
It's about mobility. It is about the capacity of our children to be educated so that they can be mobile, mobile in, our, in, in an economy uh, that, we're, that they're going to inherit from us. Uh, and so uh, part of any education policy has to focus on what are the jobs as governor that I can have come here, stay here. I'm in competition with 49 other states, as I know, and that will grow here and employ my citizens who are coming out of um, high school and, and these great community colleges and our universities. Because uh, then, if there's economic growth, then I can, then as governor, I can reinvest it into our local communities, local aid, and our public schools. So big data and the economy, those may be the long-term solutions, knowing that the short-term ones we have to fix as well. Mr. Apple? Well, you asked a very specific question about how to deal with troubled youth in the context of school and education in the community. And I would like to just make it a little broader to answer, which is, where are the places where you can intervene in the cycle, the cycle of poverty, effectively, the cycle of um, lack of jobs and opportunity based on lack of uh, education, leading to gang behavior often and uh, in, uh, criminal behavior, drug addiction, and, to and dysfunctional family. Where can you intervene in that cycle? We've talked a lot tonight about education as one place, one serious place. I'd like to talk about another, which is how to stem youth violence in our cities. Uh, I, first of all, I saw it as a resident so many years ago in Surgery, uh, Young Lives Lost, uh, the, the senseless violence. But I've also seen it this summer. I spent five different weekends with uh, a city councilor in Boston walking neighborhoods with a group to, in what are called Enough is Enough rallies uh, in the inner city in Boston to deal with places where young people have been shot weeks before and killed. Uh, and that was a very big learning experience. It's very clear that there's a lot that has been taken away in our cities in recent years, especially with the recession, uh, that worked pa in the past that we have to put back to intervene at this point in the cycle, which is, I would say, gang diversion. So some of it is actual gang diversion programs that do work, that we know if we can intercept these kids when they're 10, 12 years old, just on the verge of going to the gangs, which we can with certain programs, we can find them alternatives, get them back into school because they probably already dropped out uh, and away from the gang activity. Second is summer jobs programs, community policing programs, and much stronger re-entry programs for young people who've been in jail, probably didn't belong there in the first place. These are the kinds of things we have to put back by bringing back more local aid, which comes from our state government, back to cities and towns, which had been taken away during the recession. So I know if we put that back, I know that we can stem youth violence for starters and also start to have uh, more effective gang diversion. That's another place to intervene in the cycle. Megan, I think I want to talk about two other answers to your question, uh, goals and teamwork. Um, it's somehow in this country it's become uncool to reassert our goals about, uh, about poor people, people at disadvantage, and we've got to stop that. There are 4,000 kids without roofs over their heads tonight. It should be zero. And, and we really, really do need to reassert a vocabulary that's focused on that, that problem of justice in society. And I think that's, that it begins there. And I, I think whoever's governor had better be willing to have the courage to say, no, enough is enough. Inequity at this level is just not permissible. But then how do you help? I'm reminded in your question, as I often on the trail now, about a patient I took care of. He was a 15-year-old black kid, teenager with leukemia. Long story short, he, he had a fatal disease, but we cured him. We pulled out the stops, bone marrow transplant, everything. That kid got everything he needed. Uh, and I fought for hard for him. I did everything I could for him. Ten years later, he died on the streets. Cured his leukemia, killed by poverty, by racism, by injustice. It's not good enough. I want to lead a project in this commonwealth. We have 351 towns. And I will personally lead a project on a voluntary basis that any town that wants to get the back of every kid under eight Surround them with all the services that kid needs, one at a time, instead of the siloed separateness that, we, that afflicts us as we treat their this but not that, as we deal with their mental illness but not their physical illness, as with their corrections problem but not their health. I want to end that. We will have teams in any city, in this, any city or town in this commonwealth that wants to do it. We'll get the back of every kid and we'll make childhood safe for them with their families as partners. Last question of tonight. We'll go over here. Hi. Hi. Thank you, my name is Max, I'm a freshman at the college, and I wanna ask a question that's a little bit about the other side of the equation, which is how you pay for all the things that you've been talking about. Uh, you've talked especially a lot about education, about investing more in college, about establishing universal pre-K, but with the exception of Ms. Kayem mentioning reductions um, in prison spending, 
I don't think anyone has mentioned a way to either increase taxes or to cut other costs to pay for that. So I'm, ask, I'm wondering what specific provisions would you, each of you introduce, whether to raise revenue or to cut costs, in order to pay for the various plans that you're proposing? We'll start with Mr. Gretzky. Um, I think I've talked about it earlier, but I think really if you have a series of initiatives that you'd like to invest in, a series of investments, and I think we could all agree that there are probably eight or ten things that we would like to invest in, and we could come to consensus on those things that we'd like to invest in. They're going to cost a lot of money. Now, obviously, we've got to find a way to reduce health care costs in Massachusetts. We passed Chapter 224 to reduce health care costs. We've got to reduce our health care costs, using community centers, moving patients out of acute care hospitals into community centers, into community medical facilities, uh, wellness programs that can save money. So our health care system is crowding out almost everything else that we've tried to invest in. Over 40% of our state budget is in the health care expenditures, and if we don't reduce our health care expenditures, none of this is going to be possible. But let's assume that doesn't happen in the short term. So the real question is, where do you find the money to pay for it all? There's only four ways to do it. One, you can grow the economy dynamically and use that growth and the growth of revenues. Two, you can save money. I have a track record of doing that. I've saved tens of millions of dollars as state treasurer. We're on our way to saving $100 million as a state pension fund alone. That probably won't do it enough. Public-private partnerships will do some of it. So I think the real question is, are the people of Massachusetts, with a governor who's willing to be an advocate, and I'm willing to go to every one of the 40 Senate districts in the state and lead a public conversation, lead regional town meetings and say, these are the things we need to invest in, and if we can't find the money from those other sources, are you willing to make investments to improve the quality of life for every one of our citizens? Higher education, universal pre-K, mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse, those are all things that we need to invest in. And a governor who's willing to lead that conversation and who is fearless about leading that conversation and who's willing to take the consequences of that discussion, that's the kind of governor I hope you want in your next governor. I'd like to be that governor. Uh, there, it's, a, it's a big question, so there's a, a couple answers. So obviously I, I would shift priorities because budgets, anyone who's been day one, I was with this governor close to day one with this president, uh, a budget is a reflection of our values. Uh, and so I see numbers, and numbers are really, do I care or do I don't care? You can throw out any great idea, especially as a candidate, uh, and say, I love this, I love this. And unless you can actually get it done, it means nothing. Uh, so, so when I talk about criminal justice as being a reform we absolutely need, it is not simply because I think there's better policies, but actually there's better policies that are cheaper. Uh, so that you can move it. So then, so that's sort of the first step, is can you move around sort of your basic uh, uh, pools of money? Second, as, as uh, the treasurer said, how can you generate growth and economic growth? And there's a number of ways I've proposed. For one, and I, people hear, this, hear me say this all the time, I've been to 44 other states. I've been to over 50 other countries. It is actually relevant uh, for a governor's race because we are in competition for a global economy. So what can I do as a governor to attract those businesses that will come here and stay here and hire Massachusetts citizens, right? So it might be tax breaks, but I'll tell you what it is. It is workforce development, because that's the backbone of any economy, and it's infrastructure. So those events, investments will come in the short term, right? But long term, uh, they will generate revenue. And then, like as the treasurer said, I don't like it when Republicans make no tax pledges. I don't like it when Democrats make no tax pledges. We have to have a conversation. Taxes are a way to generate revenue in hard times. It's the same discussion with casinos. Uh, and so day one, uh, look at can we generate fast enough to, uh, for our investments. But if we don't do that, if we don't do those three things, uh, we will fall behind. And we will not create a society that is, uh, for, that, that can, that is prepared for the future whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, economic downturn, whatever it may be. That's our goal. I'm so glad you asked the question. <coughs> I um, am going to be the governor that controls our health care costs, as um, some of the other speakers uh, talked about. Let's just talk about the dimensions of it. Uh, it is 40% of the state budget. It's up from 20% uh, just 12 years ago, and it will be 50% by 2020. That is crowding out virtually everything that we've talked about on this stage. So we have to control health care costs. And the good news is we absolutely can control health care costs. We have a wildly inefficient system. 
I've been in the system as a, not only as a surgeon, but and as a uh, manager, and, I, and so has Don. We know how inefficient the system is. If, in fact, uh, we can bend the medical trend, we can curb healthcare costs, which we know we can by bringing efficiencies to our system, and it's 39%, that's $350 million a year. That's a billion dollars over three years that can go to some of these investments. So this is not, gee, I hope we can control healthcare costs. We have to control healthcare costs, and we absolutely can. Our own Health Policy Commission, which was formed from the law that Steve is referring to, Chapter 224, did our first study in which we can look across uh, all, all the people who are covered now, because everyone is covered, and understand our true cost. Their own report came out a couple months ago and says that we uh, have about $29 billion in waste. That is, health care that we're spending without getting improved outcomes. That's $29 billion. Now, that's not just in the state government. That's across all expenditures. But that shows you the magnitude of inefficiency that we have in our system. And by moving towards more organized systems of care using team, having doctors operate in teams and moving away from fee-for-service payment systems which reward quantity, not quality, we can not only have a better health care system, we can have it much more affordable. And for the state government, that creates a lot of room to invest in things. I might also say it's the biggest budget buster in our cities and towns. So our municipal governments, we have to control health care costs. We can do it. We can do these things without raising taxes by doing that, and that's uh, what I would do as governor. Well, Max, thanks. I, I, uh, I understand financial discipline. I started a small organization, grew it to global scale, and never laid a worker off, and thrived as an organization. I know what it's like to run a successful organization and, a suc and can do it at the public sector as well. We have to find the money, though. There are three sources of money that I can think of that are big. The first is health care expenditures, as Joe has said. It's 42 percent of the state budget. We, we now have three independent reports saying that 34 percent, 30 percent, 38 percent of our health care expenditures are pure waste. We need to get to work on that. One of the reasons I favor single payer care is I think it's a way to get some of the administrative costs out right away. That will take a governor who understands what the new health care system really needs to look like and is, has the courage and the confidence to progress our system toward that and, and billions will be saved. It's $14 billion in our state budget. If we could save 10 percent of that over the next few years, that would be a billion dollars a year to put into our roads and our schools. The second are tax loopholes and exemptions, something I've been looking at quite closely now, and you'll soon hear more reports on that from our legislature. They are massive. They've gotten there through special interests in many as in many political environments through the years. It's time to reset them to zero. Tax loopholes that add jobs, I would love to keep and add. Tax loopholes that support the safety net I'm in favor of. The others are zeroed out and there's billions there. Finally is we do have to need to change our, our approach to taxation. It needs to be fair in this Commonwealth. We need to have a regime in this Commonwealth in which people at low end, low end income spectrum pay lower rates and people at the higher end pay higher rates. We've got to move there. As governor, I will try to move our Commonwealth into that fair tax um, uh, pr approach and we, we will need resources to invest that will come back in the savings that will come when we're not kicking the can down the road on all these important problems. So I have for the last 16 years had to look at a budget first with VA uh, and hiring folks and looking at what money we have in, in the last eight years, not only looking at how I run my own Attorney General's office, uh, but what I can do for the Commonwealth. And one of the things that I know every day, you know, taxpayers pay my salary. I'm conscious that we have the obligation as an attorney general, as a treasurer, as a governor, uh, to make sure that we make the decisions that are going to be cost effective. I think we waste a lot of money in this state. I see it. And so you start there. You know, whoever becomes governor comes in halfway through, starts a budget in January, and I think you need to do a top-down look at what we spend money on, what we accomplish, what we need to invest in in terms of technology, get some bond bills, invest in things that will make us more cost effective, and figure out, as Juliet said, where are those investments that you need to make money. I do believe as the economy turns around, we will have additional revenues. But I've spent time for every dollar I got in my budget, we brought back 10 because we've cut back on waste, fraud, and abuse. We bring back hundreds of million dollars in Medicaid fraud. We brought back money from Wall Street. Uh, both to individuals and to the states for the predatory lending. I'm very, very conscious of trying to make every dollar make sense, and I think you have to look at what we spend now, where we can get efficiencies, where we have to invest, and I think none of us on this stage really know what that's going to cost or where we're going to have to go for it or what that budget's going to be, but those are the first things you need to do. What do your revenues look like? 
What do you need to invest in to save money with what you do? How do you cut waste, fraud, and abuse? And then figure out realistically, what is your real budget that you can work with, and how do you do it so it's cost effective for the taxpayers in Massachusetts? I don't believe those are mutually exclusive. I think government can be good and cost effective if we have the right management in the governor's office. Uh, before we thank all the candidates for coming to tonight's forum, I wanted to let you know ways to get involved with these campaigns now that you've heard the candidates speak. Uh, in the back of the forum, you'll see there are boxes, uh, six different boxes with the five campaigns and also board members of the Harvard College Democrats. If you'd like to get involved, please go to them. They have information uh, uh, and materials on how uh, to actually start working on these campaigns. Uh, also, some of the candidates will be sticking around afterwards, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come up to the stage and ask them. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking the candidates one more time for coming to the forum.